Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Nicole Soames. She's a best-selling author and CEO of Diadem Performance, working with over 85 clients across the globe, helping thousands of people become commercial athletes in selling, influencing, account management, marketing, strategy, coaching, and leadership. But before we get a chance to speak with Nicole, it's the Leadership Packing News. In the news today, we'll explore the relationship between leadership and professional athletes. Professional athletes can sometimes have a bad reputation, with stories of out of control behaviour often seen in the media. This front page drama in which the media in all facets of news can often overshadow great athletic performances, and as such it's easy to forget the important contribution that athletes make consistently to society. Sports nut and journalist James Bailey wrote an article in Bloomberg's Business Week called Athletes, Natural Born Leaders and he focuses on five reasons why professional athletes will make great leaders. And here are those five reasons. Reason one, professional athletes are determined. True, many are endowed with physical gifts, but realizing them is hard work. Progressing in sports means negotiating an increasingly exclusive series of hurdles that can't be cleared without discipline, focus, patience, practice, and then more practice. It takes decades of sweat and investment to bring whatever a leader possesses to fruition. We simply won't follow somebody who hasn't demonstrated determination. Reason 2. Teamwork. These men and women won't just preach teamwork, they practice it. A sports team is just like a jazz band. Integration is necessary to gather a coherent whole, but everybody gets a chance to shine. There may be a most valuable player, but he or she is first among equals. Everybody has a job to do and nobody gets a ring or trophy. More than ever, modern organisations need cross-functional teams to support them. Reason 3. Appreciating fellowship. Professional athletes appreciate fellowship, or follow the leader, as it's often known. And it's not just a playground game. It's actually an experience in serving greater purpose. Athletes understand the tangible advantages of executing a plan, and their goal achievement is often contingent upon them following that plan well and truly and leading is rooted in having learned lessons of following reason four cognitively complex they are cognitively complex they grasp a dynamic flow of many interrelated variables simultaneously and any fan will tell you that any successful sporting team or sports franchise can be really quite convoluted and complex the plays themselves also have intricacies upon intricacies and one wits a challenge with a hundred unpredictable factors that require seamless adaptation and improvisation on and off the field or the pitch. And it's this kind of agile thinking and adaptability in today's fast-moving world that's an essential part of leadership. And reason number five, the ability to handle pressure. Professional athletes know what it's like to work under pressure. There are enormous stakes. A lot of people are watching. There's investment in time, talent, money, reputation all of these are ever present they have to check out anxieties and injuries they have to stay calm cool and collected under pressure if one player loses his or her nerve or composure the efforts and the rest of the team could be absolutely flawed and there is nothing more valued in today's stressful business environment than having a level head so there we have it five reasons why transferring that to the commercial world that's another story well, that's been a leadership pack in news Now we've explored professional athletes make great leaders. Let's get into the show. Our special guest on today's show is Nicole Soames. She's the CEO and founder at Diadem Performance, and she's the best-selling author of four books, The Negotiation Book, Influence Book, The Coaching Book, and The Presenting Book. Nicole, welcome to The Leadership Hacker. 
Hello. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, Nicole. It seems like an age since you and I last met. But in the meantime, we've been through one lockdown, two lock. I think we're in our third lockdown as we record this. How's life for you? Well, I'm, I'm just desperately hoping it's the third and final. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. So for those folk that are tuning in today that haven't met you before, perhaps it'd be useful just to give a little bit of a backstory as to how you've arrived at doing what you're doing. Sure. So I grew up at working for a company called Unilever, selling trunker loads of household brands to major customers that I'm sure you would have heard of, like Tesco and Sainsbury's and Waitrose. So think trunker loads of fish fingers, magnum ice creams. And then when my freezer was full, I decided to move on to selling chocolate digestives, Jaffa cakes, hula hoops. So massive household brands, huge uh, multi-million pound contracts. And as my career developed, so did the level of responsibility I had. Instead of just having the pressure of managing these multi-million pound customer relationships, I also found myself responsible for managing large teams of people, managing those large customers themselves. So I suppose full on blue chip corporate life. And the more the years ro rolled forward, the more it dawned on me that my passion was not just for business, it was also for people. So I decided to retrain as a coach and a facilitator. And I've been doing that now for, I'm sort of embarrassed to say, but 17 years. And I've got the scars to prove it and the grey hair. <laughs> awesome. What was the moment then for you that thought, right, I'm going to pivot away from my corporate life and focus more on helping others? I don't know if there was an actual moment, but I was given the privilege when I was selling Jaffa cakes and hula hoops, working for a company called United Biscuits to be a sort of internal trainer, partnering up with external trainers. And I found myself at the front of the room leading and trying to help people get better at their jobs. And I was like, oh, quite like this being up at the front and having a platform uh, and that was, I think, the first eureka moment, if you like, that I had that was perhaps helping people and being in the people business was was my vocation, was my destination. Yeah. So I think that was when it first really dawned on me. But I think in reality, it's only on reflection that you draw those conclusions. I'm not sure it's like it happens live in the moment. Yeah. And the focus of the work that you do with Diadem Performance now is all about that kind of people development space, isn't it? And helping people move through different situations. And I guess much of the work that you've done over the last six months has probably been more remote focused and virtual world. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely trying to help people be the best version of themselves in in this current environment but it was always it was always thus and I think anything to do with people and helping people it's a bit like food and medicine will always need those things um, and, and I would sort of describe myself and my team at Diadem as performance trainers and coaches not the sort you'd find in the gym because they're all closed right now uh, but the sort um I suppose we're about training commercial, what I would call commercial athletes. So I've got this notion, this hypothesis that in business, we expect a sustained performance, much like you'd expect on the pitch or on the field, the sort that is what I would say is delivered by athletes. Yet in the commercial world, we expect those results, but we're not nearly commercially fit enough or agile enough or even resilient enough. And that's where myself and my team come in. We're about helping create commercial athleticism in teams, in organisations, in companies. You and I have spoken about this before, actually, and the whole principle of organisations don't take as seriously their commercial fitness as well as maybe they do their financial fitness or their product development or their marketing strategies. What's the reason you find from your experience that organisations don't apply that same level of thinking? I think it's rooted Steve, in the fact that it's damn so easier to measure the financial performance and it's mm. easier actually to provide people with technical support than it is soft skills. And these all of the stuff that myself and my team train and coach people in are often referred to as soft skills. Mm. But I think it's the wrong phraseology. It's the wrong title because, yeah, frankly, there's nothing soft about these skills. They're fundamentally 
they're, they're fundamentally important to success. In fact, I mean, you, there's lots of stats uh, uh, out in the marketplace on on this and just Google these the, these sorts of things. But most most of our success is down to what you would call human engineering, not technical engineering. And yet most people get support and training and help in the technical space as opposed to the soft skill space. And then you add the commercial aspect to to soft skills and it's even harder to provide the right stuff so in in my experience having worked for big blue chip organizations you you tend to well this is just my opinion i felt like i was trained by either very very clever people like professors and and university folk who were only ever theorists they'd never sat in front of customers or had to manage people themselves or you were trained by what I would call explainers who had been there, done that, and they were going to tell you what they did. Mm. And trying to provide the idea of supporting people with folk who've got authentic experience, but they're not just egoic and it's not just about them. It's actually, I think, really hard to find. So I think that's part of the reason why people don't, organizations don't provide what I would call commercial soft skills. Mm. Because it's not easy to find. And the other challenge, I think, Steve, is people don't ask for it. So if you take, for example, a team of maybe IT folk who are very, very technical, very bright and intelligent, um, and the more senior they get, the chances are that they then have to get results through others. It is extremely rare that they would go, do you know what? I think I really need some selling skills. Yeah, very true. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And then you take people in formal selling or client management or account management roles and you say, so what training do you need? They're never going to ask for sales training because it's expected they would know what they're doing. So you end up with these massive gaps and people don't know to ask for this sort of training and it's then seen as a weakness. And so you it does people don't get supported in this space yeah and i guess you also often find that people want what they want not necessarily what they need to become more effective if you ask that what what training do you want completely and they and and with the best will in the world people have blind spots they don't understand the impact they have on others and so again they wouldn't necessarily ask for these skills right so as a commercial athlete Are there any specific traits or characteristics that you observe that are essential? Well, I think that what good looks like is starting with the right mindset and the right attitude. And if you're thinking about an athlete, they would have no chance of winning if they talk themselves down. So I think the mantras I would use and the four things that are really important and in no particular order, they're all important. And it's the combination of them that is so powerful. Are, are as follows. So relationships count. I think that's a massively important belief to have. So whether your relationships are internal relationships or external relationships, the better those relations are, the easier it is to disagree, actually, the easier it is to take accountability, the easier it is to commit to actions. So relationships matter massively. So that's one mantra. Second mantra would be keep striving. Elite is not a destination. You've got to keep striving for excellence. It it doesn't fall excellence like, like manna from heaven. Ambition delivers results, but you've got to put in the blood, sweat and tears if you want to conti- and continuously put in the blood, sweat and tears if you want to achieve and be the best version of yourself. Then the next one is that together is better Working collaboratively is always more successful. Lone wolves don't win, in my opinion. Just just think of the amazing human de- uh, endeavours we've achieved through the pandemic. We wouldn't have achieved them if people hadn't collaborated. And if you think about the news right now with vaccines and vaccine nationalism that everyone's talking about, we're trying to banish that so that we can get the vaccines out to the whole of the world because we don't get out this pandemic unless we are all vaccinated. Right. So, you know, collaboration matters massively. And then the fourth mantra, I think, that is really important to the commercial athlete is every day is a learning day. You have to hone your performance, thinking like the margin of aggregated gains, you know, honing, self-reflection. And also, I think, massively key is 
honest and timely feedback from others, which giving feedback is a skill in itself. So I think those are the kind of four mindsets, if you like, that the athlete would have. And then you layer on the ability, so the capability, and then that the ability to put all of that stuff into action. So that's, I think, the standout for the commercial athlete. And I think what the commercial athlete does is they put emotional intelligence front and center into everything they do. So the how stuff is disproportionately important to the what you do the how you do it makes the difference as part of that how you do it i suspect that just like other athletes commercial athletes need to practice all of this kind of stuff definitely practice get feedback practice you know you've got to do these practices if you like every single day and and dealing with people and getting results through people is messy it's not easy it's not straightforward so continually honing and being agile and being flexible is is really important but the people aspect is is so fundamental to getting results to conversations to commercial conversations that you have people i know it sounds like a cliche steve to say it but cliches are cliches because they're true people Mm. buy people and i think what that really means is that people buy you they buy your confidence they want people want to do business with people that are like them that they trust we know this stuff but it's like not just what you what you do it's about how you do it you don't want to be sold at you don't want to be told what to do um and so the relationships and putting that at the heart of everything i think is is so fundamental and and relationships are balanced they should be mutually beneficial shouldn't feel like you're on the back foot and you shouldn't feel like you have power over the other person it should be a mutually beneficial relationship because if it's not mutually beneficial then it's a relation shaft and those (laughs) tend to work out very well for one party (laughs) definitely so so i'd love to get into this notion of commercial conversations and commercial performance and you use that word quite a lot how does that differ i think Look, in in business, the difference is that one party should be an asker and one party should be a receiver. And if the asker doesn't ask, then they have no chance of getting what they want. So I think the commercial conversations part is is about projecting confidence, is about being proactive, not reactive, whether you're the asker or the receiver. So I think that's what the difference is. It's just having confidence and control in the conversation that you are having. And the other flip of here, of course, is that if you get all of these things right in your organisation, in your teams, there is a commercial upside to this. There's a commercial benefit in you doing this. You become more productive, more happy. You people stay around longer and bottom line results go up. Correct. Exactly. Internally and externally. Of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. So in terms of you and what you do with Diadem now, maybe give us a little spin as to what the future holds for you guys. Well, the future is about doing what we do brilliantly with more teams, which is about supporting people with how do you sell and influence with emotional intelligence? How do you sell and influence and negotiate with emotional intelligence? and lead people with emotional intelligence and manage people with emotional intelligence, et cetera. All of the things that make up that commercial athlete. And if I just talk a little bit about negotiation and influencing, they're things that you have to do. You're doing every day. Maybe you're not aware of the fact that you're doing them every day, but how you do it is the bit that people will remember. Before we get into that, maybe for those that are listening, what is the difference between negotiation and influence? Or is there a difference? Massive difference. Okay, so the difference is that in selling or influencing, that's about asking. And I think it's about making it easy for the other person to say yes by emotionally and, if appropriate, commercially motivating them. So sort of think pull, not push. And, and having confidence to make that recommendation, to ask, to shift the gear from a discussion, have an opinion and back your opinion. I think that's what, to me, that's what influencing is and selling. And everybody's in sales roles. They just don't have it in their job title. Mm, yeah. Then the same. So the same principle for negotiation. People don't have. I mean, who has the title? You might have sales in your job title, 
but you're definitely not going to have negotiator in your job title. Even procurement, which is the negotiation function, isn't called the negotiation function. It's called the procurement function, which is to buy, to procure. So my definition of negotiation is it's also this communication skill. And I think what it is, put simply, is the it's about a communication skill that helps you find overlapping positions so that the outcome works for both parties. Dead easy to say in theory, yeah. <laughs> really hard in reality. Because if you think about influencing, you the influencer or the seller knows that they're asking. When it comes to the negotiation, it's so much more emotional. How on earth do you know that there is a win for both parties? tends to be in reality that one person wins at the other person's expense, either by design or just by one party lacking confidence and ambition. So there's so much more emotion and psychology, I think, involved in negotiating, which is why I think EQ, emotional intelligence, plays a massive part in negotiating masterfully. If you think about the whole philosophy of emotional intelligence, is there maybe one theme that you see that's present in communicating in a commercial way as well as influencing and negotiation i think if you understand emotional intelligence it is an intelligence so it is not one thing it's multiple things all applied in the right way yeah, so I, I would say that you can package eq really neatly into sort of three focus areas so there's stuff that you do there's self things there's things that you do which involve others and then there's also your horizon your perspective how you see the world and it is this the, the magic comes and i think the differentiation and the competitive advantage comes from packaging all those together in the commercial setting. So you don't disregard your commercial acumen and you don't disregard your technical skills. The The magic comes from combining those with emotional intelligence. Yeah. So if I'm a leader here, sat here listening to this today, and I'm thinking to myself, I need to improve the performance of my team. Where would you suggest would be the best place for me to start? I think as a leader fundamentally key is that you lead by example i think what you've got to do is you can you have to demonstrate to your team that you do this stuff yourself it's not just for the team and i think then what you've got to do so what that means you've got to do is you've got to actively support your team which means that you need to provide them with the right training shameless plug um no in all seriousness we I've found out, I mean, if you just think about the analogy of uh, parents having to homeschool their kids right now, we parents are really not the best people to be teaching their own kids. Yes, of course, parents should support what happens at school, but parents should not be relied on because they're not the best teacher for the kids. It's the same in business. The leader isn't the best person to provide the training and the skill set, if you like, they're, they're the best person to provide embedding and a safe place to practice and a place for people to make mistakes. But they you should the, the leader should invest in proper skills to to help train people up initially. So think about someone like Andy Murray. He was initially trained by Judy Murray, his mother. Mm. But then, you know, the more se serious his tennis got, the more he was trained by a whole heap of other professionals as well. Um, so I think that's a massive part of the leader's role is to provide the right formal training, but then their role is to lead by example and to allow a safe space to practice, right? So they should be these sorts of skills, influencing, negotiating, managing others, presenting, to be really successful at them, you need to practice and then do it for real. And then I think importantly, get feedback from your leader who is in the session with you so that they can make sure that the feedback is live and it's actionable and it's real time. So I think that's what the leader should do. Practice is a really interesting one. It keeps popping up every now and again in conversations I have with clients where I ask the question around, so how are you going to practice this stuff? And in response, what I typically get is I'm going to do it with this client or I'm going to do it with this customer or I'm going to do it with this team member. 
But actually, that's doing it. That's not practicing. And practicing for me is around setting specific time aside in a safe environment so that you can screw up if you have to. And it's OK. It's safe. But for whatever reason, people still find the whole notion of practicing some of this stuff really challenging and I wondered in your experience what you've observed oh yes all of that and more so I (laughs) I think that people well what people say is that they haven't got time to practice but that's because they don't see the value in the practice so uh, and it's not just about practicing it's about practicing under pressure so what tends to happen is when people they do people do prepare but they don't then role play it for real so these these skills take practicing with another person because they're about having a conversation so that's even harder you're not just reliant on yourself so you have to ask somebody else to be involved in the practice and and therefore it takes investment in time so unfortunately people think the prep stuff is the practice but it's the practicing under pressure where you can get constructive feedback that makes the difference and it's that feedback on the result of the practice that's going to really make the difference and of course if you're doing it in real time then you're not facilitating that learning loop are you correct yeah and then really important so i believe in continuous improvement comes from really good prep then doing it and then also reflecting afterwards on what worked and what didn't. And unfortunately, in commercial fast paced roles and everyone's under pressure these days, the most likely part of that continuous improvement circle that will go is the reflection. So the reflection tends to be what you get, what was the deal, what was the result, <laughs> yeah. and not actually how did you get there, what were the behaviours, what did you do, what did they do, what would you do differently, what worked, what didn't. So giving quality time to reflect afterwards every time that you have these interactions is is what helps with ultimately unconscious competence so you've taken all of these experience and you've written four books so congratulations first and foremost uh, and also best-selling author how did you end up writing four books because I'm crazy. Um, so look, I wrote the books to, I suppose, spread the word. You know, the, the four topics that I've written about are things that I'm super passionate about. And if you ever get the chance to browse the bookshelves again in an actual physical store, maybe the next time you're in an airport, it will happen. Don't worry, we'll get there soon. Um, you pick up the books in the business section or the self-help section, and they, in my opinion, are massively over-intellectualized, over-theoretical. So I, I wrote the books because I wanted to put out there some concise advice, you know, practical hints and tips that I think really work in the real world. Things that I wished people had told me earlier on in my career. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, that's why I, I wrote the books. And I can tell you what, the first one was a massive stretch. And the second one was stretching, but easier. And by the time I wrote the fourth, I was actually quite enjoying it. I knew how to do it. Um, and each time I did it, I suppose I'd honed the skill and it took me less time to bring it to market. But I think the thing that's different about the books is I've fused the concept of emotional intelligence into what is pretty obvious, you know, presenting and influencing and negotiation. And so often they are over theoretical, those topics and not actually, well, how are you going to do them? And of course, it's the how that makes a big difference to everybody that when they have a learning experience, it's that, so what do I do now? Correct. It's like now yeah. what? And actually, there's lots of exercises through throughout them. They're nice and concise and they're, they're designed so that you can put them down and come back to them. Um, and take notes and it's like a workbook it's like a handbook if you like so do you have a favorite child um <laughs> oh they're all my favorites um sounds like uh, uh strictly come dancing now you're all my favorites uh I, look they are all very different topics and they are yeah i think they're they're lasting titles i can tell you that the the one that sells the most is negotiation right 
which was the first actually. So um, it is definitely the, the fastest selling. And I think that's because most people have had less negotiation training than the other topics. So this is part of the show now where I flip the lens a little. So I'm going to now hack into all of your experience and, and try and extract all of this experience into your top three hacks. So if I could do that, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, I think the hacks would be, as a leader for sure, that you've got to properly consciously have three hats. I think your role as a leader is to manage, to lead and to coach. And they are all really, really different philosophies and skill sets, uh, but they're all about getting results through others. So that would be one of my leadership hacks is like, make sure that you consciously think about those three roles. The second would be, be 80% on it and 20% in it. It's so much, it's so easy to be overly involved in the detail. Yeah. In order for you to lead, you've got to be 80% on it, not in it. And I think that's really important. And, and then the third one is that you should be authentically you. I think it's so important as a leader that you show people and you share with them what you think and feel an aloof leader who's too perfect that doesn't show any vulnerability for me is like an ivory tower leader and you're not in the trenches with them so I really think that you have to share how you're feeling and vulnerabilities and if you take third lockdown right now it is not helpful for the team to think that the leader is not experiencing any challenges with working like this because it's challenging for everyone so that's what I mean by showing vulnerabilities so I think those are the three you know if I could package it into three things for the leader I think those would be the, the my three main pieces of advice mm. great advice as well thank you next part of the show we call hack to attack so this is where something in your life and work in the past hasn't worked out well it could have been that you've screwed up at something, but as a result of the experience, you've now taken that as a learning in your life and work. What would be your hack to attack, Nicole? My hack to attack would be you can't win them all. You literally can't. If you are winning them all, then you're not stretching yourself hard enough. And so that winning doesn't then present you with the best learning opportunity. So I, I think that when you don't win you get those best learning opportunities and it's uncomfortable and it's painful, but they're the best places to learn. So you've got to dig deep and then dust yourself down and get back up again. And I think what happens is people give up too easily or they keep themselves in their comfort zone. You know, as, as humans, we are always trying to find the shortcuts. We're always trying to find the least life line of resistance. So that's what keeps us out of our stretch zones. But I think you've got to keep yourself in your stretch zone. If it, if you didn't fall over, then you didn't try hard enough. So that would be, that would be my, mm. uh, my hack to attack, if you like. Like you can't win, you cannot win them all. Awesome. And you've got to be pitch fit. And I like the way you framed it. So you started off with, you can't win them all. And then it was almost a case of, no, you mustn't win them all because actually the, you don't get learning. And I was coaching uh, a startup a couple of weeks back and the uh, CEO who's running this startup, very, very smart guy, many startups before. His sole philosophy is I need to fail as often as I can in this first few months so that I can really learn what I need to do. And I just love that whole mindset of why failure is good. Yeah. I mean, clearly you can't keep failing. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise there's something else that's going wrong. No, you can keep learning. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't fail it. I think, you know, in all seriousness, you yeah. mustn't fail at the same thing again. And that's not then demonstrating you're taking the learnings. True. Like with everything in life, it's a balance, isn't it? Definitely. The last thing we'd like to do with you is offer you the chance to do some time travel. You get to bump into Nicole at 21 and give her some words of wisdom. What would your advice be? My, my words of wisdom to my younger self would be, you literally don't need to know everything. Um, you will, as you get older, Nicole, realize that nobody knows everything. Uh, so the secret is to surround yourself with people that are wiser and smarter than yourself and they will lift you up in your life. So I, I would definitely say that I, I wish I'd have known that when I was I was 21. The, ne the next thing I would say, Nicole, your career is going to be long. Don't be in a rush. I, I'm not saying you should wait for the tap on the shoulder, but patience is a virtue. If I hadn't have had 
that real gritty, authentic commercial experience, I don't think I'd be nearly as good a coach and a trainer as I am now yeah. if I hadn't gone through that. And the last thing that I would say to me at that age is if you want to be happy, then you really need to make sure that you love what you do. And even more importantly, you love who you do it with. And again, you you have to learn that you love it. You can't just go, oh, I love that. It's not a surface thing. It's a deep thing. You've got to really know what your, if you want to stay the, dis- the, the distance, you've got to really, really know that you love what you do. And then you've got to make sure you surround yourself with people that you really love as well. And then you will be sustained in your happiness. And I am so, so fortunate to have found that in my career and with my team and with my clients, you know, it's, uh, I really am very, very lucky. But you make your own luck. You do make your own luck and you grab those opportunities. But I, I feel, I, I do wake up every day and go, oh, I'm really, really lucky that I get to do what I love. And I'm not just saying that in a cliche way. It's genuine. I really do love yeah. what I do. And very wise words too. So thank you for sharing those. Pleasure. So the final thing for us to kick around is that I'm pretty certain people are going to be listening to this thinking, how do I get hold of some of, Nicole's insights where do I get a copy of the book how can I find out what diadem performance are doing where would you like us to send them so the book the classic places like Amazon WH Smiths uh, Forbes Waterstones all of the usual all of the usual suspects you can find all of the books um in terms of following me personally and diadem find us on LinkedIn so I'm Nicole Soames on LinkedIn I'm on Twitter as well so that's Nicole diadem that's my handle and then you can also find me on Facebook Nicole Soames author and I've got a an author's website so it's nicolesoamesbooks.com so lots of places lots of places to find me and I do regularly blog as well with my philosophies and my opinion on things so yeah that's how people can get hold of of me and diadem performance website is diademperformance.com brilliant we'll put all of those links in our show notes as well thank you very much nicole thank you for taking time out i always love chatting to you i always get a sense of energy and you can tell you love what you do because it comes through in the passion and the way you describe things so on behalf of our listeners thank you for being part of the leadership hacker podcast and thank you for inviting me really enjoyed it I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event or you would like to sponsor an episode please connect with us via our social media and you can do that by following and liking our pages on twitter and facebook our handle there is at leadership hacker instagram you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker and at youtube we're just leadership hacker so that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been the leadership hacker